Our scripture reading for this morning is out of the book of Genesis, chapter 3. And while this passage kind of touches the whole book, I didn't think you wanted me to read the whole chapter. So what I'm really focusing on this morning are verses 8 through 10. Um, That's kind of the crux of it all. So here are these words from Genesis found in chapter 3, beginning at verse 8. They heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees in the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? The man said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. May God lead us in the blessings of these words today. When my son was little, we used to read him stories, not necessarily at bedtime, because he was a kid that would ask to go to bed early if he was tired. Yes, very strange. But we would read the occasional fairy tale, and it would always end with, and they lived happily ever after. When he was in his first day of kindergarten, he came home excited about being there. Next day, he was excited about being there. Third day, he was royally ticked because he had to write a letter of apology. What had happened is on the school playground, my son and a fellow student in his class wanted to go on the ride at the same time. And as the story goes, my son put his hand on the rail to start to ascend the steps, and the other kid pushed him aside and said, it's my turn. Now, My son is not one who goes looking for a fight. In fact, he tries to avoid them. But if he has no choice, he'll take you out. And he took this kid out. And his classroom of friends quickly divided. There were those that were Avi's people, and there were those that were Travis's people. And it took about a month for the teacher and the principal to generate some reconciliation. The first step was to write a letter of apology. My son didn't like it, but he did it. He first started by saying, I'm sorry, you're a jerk. And I went, no, that's not going to (laughs) work. But what I noticed in his beginning days of kindergarten were very different from my beginning days of kindergarten. You know, it took a number of weeks for us to kind of break off into our own little groups and cliques and factions. For the first couple of weeks, we were just this one big homogeneous unit who were just happy to be there. And we just kind of moved like this school of fish from all of our activities. But as the school year went on, there were... Anne Marie's people, and there were Kristen's people, and there were my people, and there were Fred's people. And we didn't necessarily war with each other. We just kind of had our interests in our things. In my son's class, alienation is what was generated. And for some of those kids, that alienation still remains today, even though they're all coming to complete their freshman year of high school. There are still kids from that group that will not talk to each other. How sad. Whatever happened to happily ever after? Where you have your battles, you have your conflicts, you have your situations, and you come to a point where you recognize this is how it needs to end, and we accept that's the way that it is. And we learn to live with it and work with it and abide by it. But we live in a world, and we live in a day and a time, when that's very difficult to have happen. I see it every time a couple becomes divorced. The last couple I counseled, the woman especially, she wondered if she'd ever be happy again, because the person she was convinced that she should spend her life with said, I no longer love you, and I no longer want to be around you. I did a visit a number of years ago with a widower that he just sat in his room staring at the television in the room of the nursing home and he wonders where his life went. 
These are just two drastic examples of what alienation can look like. There are other examples. And they let us down, and they break our hearts, and they're very difficult. Before I go any further, let me ask a simple question. How many of you have ever been disappointed? I know, that's a dummy say what question. Completely crushed? Felt totally kicked out of whatever circle you were in? Let down? Wondering how could this happen to me? I did everything right? What was the situation? Who were the people that were involved? And in that moment where you had your crushing blow, where you just felt all the happiness and joy go out of you with one big breath, in that moment, did you wonder if you could ever be happy again? When was the last time you had to experience of having a major dream melt away? It could be a trip that you were looking forward to and had to cancel at the last minute. The idea that you thought you were feeling better and your health was doing great, only to have your doctor say, no, you really need to work on a few more things. As human beings, we seek to live with some form of personal happiness, but so many times, people, situations, and the inconvenient surprises can easily kill a happy thought, a happy moment, or a happy dream. I have known people who believe that the entire cosmos has been constructed to foster their own personal contentment or to guarantee them their own happiness, and they are still waiting to this very day for their happily ever after to begin. But what they're really experiencing is a separation, a barrier imposed that does not allow them to cross over from the self-entombed place that they are to the happiness that can be provided by our loving God. And no matter how hard they try, they simply cannot be happy until everything around them is going exactly their way. Nim manipulate me, or you, they're not going to be happy. This type of behavior does not promote happiness. And what it really promotes is alienation. Alienation is when the social relationship reflects a low degree of integration or common values and a high degree of distance or isolation between individuals or between an individual and a group or a people in a community or in a work environment. Alienation is different from being shy or introverted. Being shy is an apprehension, a lack of comfort or awkwardness when in the proximity of other people. Introversion takes place in, a, when in solitary activities. They would prefer listening and pondering and reflecting rather than sitting there and talking to everybody at a party. At a party, an introvert will be by themselves or herself watching the social dynamics and processing them. At that same party, a shy person will be the one who will be rearranging the dessert table so they don't have to deal with any of the people at the party. But a person who feels alienated, they will be the ones who get ready, get dressed, drive their car to the party, and then stay in their car for an inordinate amount of time and then take themselves home because they, they do not feel that they would be part of the crowd because they are convinced they would just not fit in. The story of Genesis chapter 3 verses 8 through 10 really hits the story of alienation. In chapter 3 there is temptation, there is inquest, there is judgment, and there is expulsion. Why? Because Adam and Eve sin. And then they try to hide that sin from God. They expressly do what God has forbidden them not to do. They eat of that tree of knowledge of good and evil. Then they pass the buck when God holds them accountable. Adam blames Eve. Eve blames the snake. But it doesn't really matter because in the end of chapter 3, they all get their comeuppance. And they are removed by God from paradise on earth. The ground becomes cursed. Childbirth is made painful. 
Adam and Eve brought on the worst punishment themselves as a direct result of eating of that forbidden fruit of the tree. They were expelled from Eden, heaven on earth. And God did not intend for this to happen, I believe. But it is a result of the intentional act of sin. So God acted accordingly. Where there was once a perfect union between God and the creation of humanity, an element of alienation from sin separates and continues to separate us from God to this very day. In eating from the tree of knowledge and good and evil, Adam and Eve experienced a self-conscious like never before. They became aware of how humanity distinguishes the difference between one person to the next the friends we make, the spouses we marry, the differences of gender, ethnicity, cultural backgrounds, level of economics, even what makes one nation different from the other. That awareness was birthed when that fruit was eaten. Alienation from the fall means that we are no longer in in, an integral connection with creation, with God, or with each other. Instead of a connection, despite our differences, we, are, we more likely feel disconnected from the, from the opportunities and feel naked and ashamed because our differences make us feel like we consistently lose. With alienation, our eyes have been opened in a way that estranges us from the world around us and the God who created and loves us. Even if God had allowed them to remain in the Garden of Eden, The innocence of that paradise was lost. It would be impossible for any of us to enjoy the garden when he or she is hiding from the things that we are afraid of all the time. Now, I remember in seminary reading an article of a defense attorney who responded to the fall of humanitarian. Humanity, that moment when those created in God's image had alienated themselves from the loving creator. Now, I will tell you up front, I don't agree with this article, but it's kind of interesting to think about. First, the defense attorney stated that the tree was not adequately zoned off. There was no warning signs whatsoever. All they had was a verbal warning from God, do not eat. It, that's it. Do not tu- there was no do not touch, there was do not look, there was do not sniff, there was do, do not go near. Do not eat. The defense attorney went on to explain how his clients, Adam and Eve, would ex- had experienced damages, sudden distress, which deprived them of their home and their lifestyle. The defense attorney maintained that God intended that Adam and Eve to eat the fruit, speculating that the servant was some type of a theme park employee acting on God's wishes while God was playing head games with his client. Then the defense attorney accused God of leading Adam and Eve down a, by, down a predictable path that led to their expulsions. In other words, this alienation that I've been talking about, God was the one who created it. But the definition of alienation, as I've highlighted earlier, is an intentional turning away leading to a feeling of estrangement. The state of being an outsider or feeling isolated, alienation is also a sense of loneliness, which I believe is the dominant plague of our modern times. It depicts, if you look on the front of the bulletin, you see this picture called Nighthawks. It was painted by Edward Hopper, and it captures the idea of alienation very well. Go ahead and keep looking at it while I talk a little further. It depicts an all-night diner with three customers lost in their own thoughts, sitting around, a bar, sitting around on baller stools. There are fluorescent lights in this picture, which was a new invention of the early 1940s, and it emits an eerie glow attracting lost souls like urban moths. But where's the door to the diner? There is none. 
There was no way to escape the alienation in this picture. All you can be is trapped and consumed by it. There is no way in. There is no way out. Just a seamless wedge of glass. Patrons under glass could have been an alternative name. We see them and see them sitting there. We can almost relate to their situation. But we cannot enter. We cannot have a relationship with them. They are separated from one another. They are separated from us. They are remote. They are alone. They are alienated. Alienation is a crippling social disease because it makes you question whether life is even worthwhile. It makes you wonder why you go to work, why we buy homes, cars, food, and clothes. It seems that life can be absurd if we remove anything of meaningful anything that we possess that is important. Alienists can rob us of all of that. In this country that we live in, with supposedly the highest standard of living in the world, the third leading killer of all people after automobile accidents and cancer is suicide. And often a note is left behind, and it almost always reveals some sort of alienation that that person in their life felt before their death. Fortunately, and I do mean fortunately, and I celebrate this, there are more constructive ways to stop the pain of alienation than suicide. And it is here that I take my official stand against that article by the defense attorney who personally placed God on trial for the fall of humanity and the alienation that ensued. What we have to remember first and foremost is that God never promised that life would be a rose garden. It would not be always filled with parties and places of leisure. God did not promise, but God did promise to us an authentic community of people who could care and embrace us despite the things that we're ashamed of. We call this community, get ready for it, the church. And the church can serve as an antidote to alienation. Authentic community is where you come and you feel welcome, even if you feel like you did not meet your goals this wet this past week. The to-do list you put together, you couldn't get it done. The stuff that your boss wanted you to do in the office, you couldn't complete. The th- things that you wanted to try to accomplish, that new book you wanted to read, couldn't get it done. However tired, broken, and weary you feel, authentic community is where people stand with you during the tough times when we are hurting and feel unattractive. Church becomes a community that makes us feel wanted, belonging, whole, no longer separated, alienated, and alone. The long-standing witness of this church is its ongoing care of its members down through the centuries. The ministries of the church have a way of looking after one another, starting with the staff moving down through the rest of the body, sending cards, making phone calls, saying, hey, how you doing? I care. Tell me your story. But what really makes it work, and to truly be effective, is to genuinely glorify God with everyone you meet, and everyone you encounter, to make the conscious decision to stand up and be part of that person's life. As you share your gifts, you help them recognize theirs. You are then building in that moment the kingdom that we are called to serve and that we are called to share. If we treat church, though, like the entrance to amusement park, We stand there at the ticket gates, staring at the signs and the rides, and if we never do go in, and all we do is go home kicking ourselves because we didn't go in and participate and give it a try, then how have we generated community? Instead, what we're breeding is a form of alienation under the roof. Wouldn't it be better to go in and try? Try the rides, play the games, lose some money at the one-armed badnets, eat some really unhealthy food, experience the joy and the excitement and the thrills and the laughter that comes from joining in. 
being part of the community, being one in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. We should never let alienation deprive us of the place that we can have in our own personal lives. We shouldn't have to hang on to some incident or comment that has been made to us or about us to stop us from joining in. Because we have a God who is saying, come and be part of me, join me. I have a plan for you. I have a place for you. I need something from you. And I, in turn, will fill you and give you that peace and understanding that you have hungered for, that you yearn for, that I created you for. We deserve better than alienation because God created us for more than just being alienated from one, from one another and him. And it's because he sent his son Jesus the Christ, being in this post-Easter season, that we were able to gather and not feel that. We were able to gather and be more. Because of, our, because of his son, no longer do we have to, re, to feel the expulsion of events that we put ourselves through. We are allowed to become a people who don't have to think too much. And we can stop eating the fruit of self-consciousness. Instead, we can see ourselves for the way God sees us the beautiful wonders of creation that are made in his image and reflect his gifts and abilities. We can take all of that and throw it in a blender and puree it and turn it into a smoothie for the best results. And all that painful self-awareness, that fright of being part of life and estranged from others, we watch it crumble and turn into a nice slurry of nothing. We don't have to walk in terror because we think our breath might smell. Or we are afraid that our 12-hour deodorant is beginning to expire. Our bodies might be a weird shape. But we don't have to strive to please the pagan gods of the world while our creator God calls us to walk on the, cool, the beautiful cool grass. Because there are times that God does walk among us. And he says, where are you? What have you gotten yourself into? Why are you hiding yourself from me? As a church, believers, community of faith, we shouldn't have to do that because we should be able to stand there and say, God, this is what I've done. And we know that God will forgive us. We should stop forgetting with each day that we're not able to be here to focus and to grow, that we are God's creatures, and with every step, with every conversation, with every experience, every encounter, every moment, whether we're awake, aware, or asleep, and in some other la-la land, our God is there taking care of us protecting us, guiding us, healing us, embracing us. You see, we live in a world where we are constantly watching people become casualties of alienation, feeling like strangers in our own lives, hollow with no substance, But if we're truly people of God, followers of Jesus, celebra celebrators of his resurrection, then there's no room for alienation. Only communion. Only community. Only a willingness to follow God where he leads us. And that, my dear attorney friend, is why God should never be put on trial. But instead, taking an opportunity to understand. How many times have we sat there and said, boy, you know, I'm just not feeling God. I'm not sure what he's saying to me. Here's my question. What have you put in the way? Because God doesn't hold back. 
we put our hands up. We'll build the walls. We will isolate ourselves. And, well, that's another discussion. If you feel yourself doing that, ask God to help you stop. Because none of us are meant to be alone. None of us are meant to feel like we don't fit in. For we are the body of Christ called to take our uniqueness and our abilities and become one and share it with the world. God didn't create alienation. Sin did. Let's be aware. Let's be intentional. Let's consistently give ourselves over to God in each and every minute so we can feel connected because we let that presence of his son work and shine through us with every thought, with every step, and with every breath. Would you all pray with me, please? Help us to give ourselves to you, O oh God, each and every day. Help us to allow your spirit to fill us, O oh God, each and every day. Help us to have the mind and the focus to recognize that your son is walking with us each and every day. Because while there will be no paradise on this earth, your presence will give us peace. Your presence will give us connection. Your presence will lead us to be one with others. So, a loving God, we never have to feel alone, isolated, or alienated. Thank you for loving us so much that you would give so much to us every moment of our lives. We celebrate and give thanks in your son's precious and holy name. Amen. some people we encounter in this world that don't even want to see the sight of us. That's the world. That's not our God. He always wants to see us. He always wants to be with us. He always wants us to be with him. And he wants us to take that which we feel and experience and share it with the world. So through our personal ministries, there is less alienation. There is less isolation. There is more grace, which means there will be more joy 
and there will be more peace. I think that's the way we get happily ever after. It starts and it ends with our God. So as you all go from this place, as you take what you've heard, think about it, pray about it. And if the Spirit calls you to, apply some of it to your lives. But as you go from this place and spoil the women in your lives, because it is Mother's Day, do not, let the world, do not be afraid to let the world know that y'all are people of God. Go in grace. Be filled with his peace. Ladies, don't forget your flowers. Amen. Happy Mother's Day. Have a great week, everybody.